After the last video you are probably wondering, how did I take this barebones kernel and start running Linux applications on it? At the end of the day this is regular GNU LS from Core Utils, which runs just fine on something like Ubuntu. To end up to that point, some parts of the kernel had to be tweaked. The VFS or otherwise virtual file system layer is basically what makes this kind of paths understandable to the file system driver. It also handles special files like slash dev std out or slash dev no. Unix like operating systems heavily depend on this since, remember, everything is a file. Even your house is a file, even your pet, even your mom. After improving my VFS, I stumbled across a massive roadblock. The actual file system I was previously using, FA32, didn't support an essential Unix thing. Symbolic and hard links. Think about those like Windows shortcuts, although they are way more versatile. They let you make files or folders point to other files or folders without interacting with installed programs. FA32 doesn't support those, so I had to implement a different file system for the root partition. I went with ext2, which is basically ext4 without journaling. I still kept FAT32 for the separate root partition, and with all of that said done, the partition layout looks something like this. I had the ext2 up and running within 2-3 to three days, which isn't half bad, although most of the time was spent reading documentation online. Crazy stuff, I know. How do processes communicate with various privileged parts of your computer, you might ask? That's where system calls occur. They basically ask the kernel to take control and do some tasks with certain arguments. The kernel then returns back with the result of that task. Here's an example. Say a program needs to print some text. Assuming we're inside x86-64 Linux, you would do a syswrite system call with a file descriptor of 0, a pointer to the string, and the size of the print operation. If this seems complex, don't even get me started on larger system calls. And mind you, there are at least 300 of them. I didn't implement everything, but just the ones required for the programs I wanted to run. I won't bore you with the details, but it's really as painful as you would imagine. Most programs don't communicate with the system call layer directly. Instead, they use what we call a standard C library, or libc for short. All user programs are compiled and linked against this essential library. The most common one is glibc for Linux and msvcrt for Windows, if I recall correctly. Please don't quote me on that though. For CavOS, I went with Muscle, which is a lighter but fully featured glibc alternative which actually follows standards and doesn't do its own thing. Alpine Linux, for instance, uses Muscle, and it's a complete and regular distribution. Also, it's really good for static linking since it produces binaries with small file sizes. Here is where the fun truly begins, and everything starts to come together. I customized GCC and binutils so that they compiled specifically for CavOS. That means that they acknowledge the existence of CavOS and its libraries, glibc, include files, etc. This is done via simple patches that I can update at any time. With that said, I think we're ready to start porting stuff. I started off with Bash and the GNU core utils. All I did was compile them against my custom toolchain with minimal modifications to their original codebase. And after a quick test, I was finally able to navigate around and actually use the OS properly. After a bit more than half a year, I had reached my OS development journey's biggest goal, actually run and use a bash shell. After implementing Unix pipes, basically a way for processes to communicate with each other, I could even run basic scripts. I ported a lot of cool stuff, but there's one thing that tops them all. With people running Doom everywhere, even microwaves, I knew I had to try it on CavOS from the start. I used Doom Generic by OZKL, letting me run Doom's WAD files on a simple frame buffer without much effort.
As you can see, I haven't implemented scan codes yet, but it works, even on real hardware. Overall, there has been a lot of more work behind the scenes that many of you would consider boring. I have faced many big roadblocks where I had to spend days or even weeks debugging very weird bugs. It really is possible for a tiny mistake to cause massive headaches in the OSF world. No matter the difficulties and unimaginable amounts of time spent on this, I am quite proud of the result. If you enjoyed what you saw, subscribe and join our community. Until the next one, stay safe everybody.